Jo, Freunde der Anarchie, äh, willkommen zurück auf Lasergruppenland. Ähm, ja, Vanilla Minecraft Server, wisst Bescheid. Wen haben wir denn hier? Die üblichen Verdächtigen. Oh mein Gott, ich dachte gerade, da wäre jemand mit einem. Ähm, Erschrocken mir einfach das Pferd angegriffen. Ich dachte, da wäre jemand mit einem äh, Feuerschwert. Ähm, das wäre natürlich eine kleine Inconvenience gewesen. Ähm, wir haben natürlich zu Teil des Tages mal wieder was von der DEFCON rausgeholt. Vom DEFCON Conference Channel. Ein Video von ähm, 2019 mit 1200 Aufrufen mit dem Titel J. Die, Ma Die Martino. Uh, the Art of Detection. DEFCON 27 Packet Hacking Village. Ist da irgendwas verdreht? Ist das nicht normalerweise vorne? DEFCON 27 Packet Hack Hacking Village? Keine Ahnung. What do I know? Hier. Okay. So, now it is one o'clock and with all that set up time, we're good. We're good. Yeah. All right. All right, well, we're good. So, it's my uh, pleasure. Um, Jay, you presented, oh, wow, actually in this area, seems like yesterday, 2016. So, without much ado, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Jay DiMartino Fidelis. Thank you guys, thank you. So we've all kind of been there, most of us who kind of work like either sock work or malware analysis or, you know, um, where you, you end up writing rules, right? Um, I'm just going to kind of give you a methodology or at least my methodology of how I write rules and, and how I go about things. You don't have to adopt it. I don't care if you do. Um, but uh, ich das it, hopefully yeah. it gets it better out there and we can all rise up and uh, start crafting good detections and whatnot. So my name is J.D. Martino, um, head of detections and countermeasures at, uh, for the Fidelis Threat Research. Um, that's just some fancy title my boss gave me. Really, I'm just like the rule bitch, right? So uh, <laughs> that's pretty much how it goes. Um, there are some prerequisites to this talk. Uh, I do a lot with uh, re regular expressions and with Yara, so that's all my examples are going to kind of center around those two. Um, if you are unfamiliar with Yara, the talk that Ming just mentioned that I did back in 2016 was um, to catch an APT, Yara, and I go through more of the syntax and whatnot. Uh, so if you want to learn that, I definitely suggest going back and watching that. Um, regular expressions. Was? Uh, Müssen wir jetzt das Video zuerst anschauen? Oh. Ist der Link in der Beschreibung locker nicht, oder? Natürlich nicht. Das würde ja Sinn machen. Ah, soll ich das jetzt abtippen? Oh mein Gott. Okay, Leute, let's go. Großes Y, F. Großes Y, F. Großes F, großes V, großes Z. <coughs> Bindestrich T, I, J. Oh, Boss. B, O, S. Okay, gibt es das Video nicht? Video nicht verfügbar. gelöscht, keine Ahnung. Also der Link geht nicht. Der, das ist schon mal geil, dass die Voraussetzungen hier nicht funktionieren. Oh, I have good days and bad days. Either way. It's, if you're not doing them every day, you're, you're, yeah. Either way. So, when you're writing detections, uh, the real problem is, is that you and your co-workers, you know, you're, you're kind of building this structure and it's, it's, it's very complicated, right? And, um, Sometimes, the, you know, like the guy in the picture, he, he's, he may be looking down at what his coworker is doing. He's like, what are you doing? I'm up here. Or, or, hey, let's build this, and it's all disjointed and, and whatnot. And there's a lot of complications. It's never really easy, right? Because uh, malware will, will be at all different layers uh, upon the stack. 
and the attack surface is at all different layers. There's not one easy different thing over one protocol or you know whether it be the file or the network layer uh, or even metadata and whatnot. So what happens when you two have been working alongside of each other and all of a sudden your colleague leaves the company, right? And, and everybody, you know, it's like, it's a normal thing. Everybody leaves and it's like, hey, cheers, we're gonna throw a party for you. And he's like, yeah, man, sorry for everything. We're, you, we're gonna be friends. And then like Monday comes around and then you look at one of his detections and you're like, holy, yeah. right? It, it's like, I, I kind of equate it to Monopoly, right? And you get the chance. Everybody wants to go to, to go and collect $200, right? Everybody wants that. But it's like in this case, no, you gotta pay the other players. <laughs> You're taking your lumps. Like I said, I'm the rule bitch, right? So I learned this the hard way. Um, so, so that being said, how, how do we, how do we, how do we rise up to the occasion, right? Um, so I'm gonna throw another one. I probably should have said this earlier. Uh, the, the other prerequisite for this is, is a little bit of, you know, set theory and whatnot that most of us probably learned in computer science. So yes, I'm gonna give you some Venn diagrams. It was the only way or the best way I can kind of convey it to you, uh, and whatnot. And so... You know, you have your universal set. That's the set of everything. Everything that's going on, whether it be the network, the endpoint. Uh, and then you have your detection, your target, right? What are you trying to signature? Uh, I call it a target. And so um, and it's, you know, you're trying to pick that needle out of the haystack. Um, so when, when you finally go for it and you write your detection, you end up getting these other set of events. I really don't have a better name for them. They're just another set of events. We all know them as mostly false positives though, right? But they're not exactly all the others. They're just some random others that some of which happen to overlap with our target. And those are the ones that are the false positives. And so, you know, you have your red set. Your red set on the left-hand side is the target. Uh, that's your detection. The blue set is your other. Um, It, it may not always be large, you know, your, your other, your false positives, they could be a lot smaller. Um, and then the purple area is in the middle. That's what you're trying to eliminate, right? You're trying to eliminate that purple area. So how do you do that? How do you do that? Uh, I, I call it shrinkage. <laughs> so we want to shrink that other event set. Um, if we could shrink that other event set, we can get the union of the two sets to be smaller, right? Um, the typical way that people mostly do this is kind of with um, some sort of and not, you know, hey, I got this detection, oh, and not my domain controller. Oh, and not this file that passes, you know, from this person to this person every day via a cron job or something like that. And so you, you have like these kind of one-off detections where like a, uh, you know, this one set is a subset of your other, and then you have another, and it's a, a, a subset of that other, and you have a third other, which is all still a subset of that other. Um, and so you end up with these long kind of daisy chains of and not situations where you're just kind of filtering out. And, you know, those are, those are somewhat maintainable, um, but those aren't really maintainable either. At least they can get out of hand and whatnot if not done properly. So, how, how do you do that? So, how, how do you how do you shrink, you know, your false positives? Um, there's, like I said, there's the and not method. Um, but once you do that enough, your other set gets really really small, and it, it just, like I said, it gets hard to maintain but then your target set still stays large. So is there anything, and there's not so much of an overlap, but it's enough that it creates in your workflow uh, where it takes time out of your workflow to be going through some of these false positives and you just don't want to be dealing with them anymore. So we've manipulated the other set, right? So what about maybe taking a look at the targeting set? You know. Um, 
And then, so back to shrinkage. We're going to try and shrink that targeted set, your detection. How do we uh, shrink that profile, right? That, that, that attack profile of that detection and whatnot. And yes, you can do it. Um, one of the situations uh, that the target set grows over time is because of false negative situations. Um, you get, you find new activity all the time, and your target set just, you, you end up taking on more of these sets. Uh, your target one, and now you have another target two, some mutual exclusive set that has nothing, it's involved, but then it's kind of not involved with the other set, and then you have to merge those two together. Um, and then, like I said, that's a growing, it's literally a growing problem. You have two sets converging together, uh, and it's getting bigger, and your other set may or may not be getting smaller, but it, it just doesn't become maintainable. And what I like to uh, call that sort of talk is kind of the one rule to rule them all mentality. Um, analysts like to write these catch-all rules um, where, you know, <laughs> the Lord of the Rings effect, I guess. And so, uh, you know, we, we write these really large monolithic detections that just, like I said, they become un unmaintainable, right? And so um, you got to kind of know when to separate or chain your detections. And then you also, you kind of drop or ignore some of the true positives. And maybe you didn't pick them up with another tech detection, with either with a lesser confidence detection or with a lesser severity detection. Um, and so you, you can kind of shrink that, that target set a little bit. Just to kind of give you an example, right? So uh, at one point in my career, I inherited this network uh, network uh, Yara rule for Ghost Rat, and it was literally it was it was a hundred different beacon strings that we were targeting in the one rule, and and you look at the condition at the bottom, and and then all the number of condition all the number of beacon strings that we were we were looking at. Notice the first for loop goes from A to Z, and then there's another, uh, the second for loop from A star, and then a, th a third for loop B star, and a fourth for loop C star. So we've enumerated the alphabet going on the fourth time. That's how many times we've enumerated those, uh, those, uh, those detections and whatnot. And so, uh, what if what if one of them starts going crazy? How do you how do you adjust this? How do you adjust something that's so monolithic? You literally have a hundred indicators of compromise in your in your target in your target set. Um, and and we all get we all get defensive about our rules as analysts. Um, you know, it, it, it's our babies. We curate these and whatnot. And so there is a, a, a kind of a effect that it's like, oh, my precious. Oh, oh yeah. And, and so, mm. This is here. Unspielbar here. Also, die anderen scheinen es ja nicht zu stören. Okay. Ooh. Interessant. Okay. Wir gehen hier hoch und runter von 20 auf 200 CPU Spikes. Okay. Was machen die Leute denn? Also, ist ja fast niemand da. What the fuck? Well, like 
we don't want nothing to happen to them, but the life cycle shows that we have to, we have to do something about it. So, so let me, I'm gonna give you some, some clues and I'll, I mean, I'll talk a little bit, but I'll give you some more kind of examples. Um, so how do you do that? You separate multiple detections. You take the one, take target set, the full set, you separate it from uh, target one and then target two, and then they have a couple of other sets in between there as well. Um, and now your sets just got smaller, right? So this one is a lot larger, and then we've separated it out, and now we have two smaller sets to kind of deal with. One set may not be giving you problems, but another set may be giving you problems. But at least when you do it, you've done your work up front, you've done all your analysis up front, that you don't necessarily have to manage the T1 set. Or if the T1 set's giving you problems, you don't have to manage the T2 set when you go in and make your changes. And then to even further slice it, you can make it into even more. Just further slice it, and then the sets become even smaller, and then they have a lot less kind of management and whatnot with them. So uh, just as a kind of warning, uh, I, I, I am including some rules, so I'm going to throw a bunch of walls of text at you. Um, if you do want to come back and watch the, the, the um, there's a lot of good tidbits in some of these next few slides. I suggest coming back. You're not going to ingest all this stuff, and especially the syntax that I got going on with some of these. You're not. You're going to be like, whoa, what's? <laughs> so you're going to need to take a second to kind of parse through it and whatnot, though. But the main things that I want you to kind of focus for the next couple slides are the constructs and the naming and whatnot, and I'll kind of walk you through the rest and whatnot. So, so one thing you can do with Yara, at least, is you can separate by condition. Um, that ghost rule that I said earlier, notice that, so there was, I, I at least noticed that there was different lengths of our detection set, um, our indicators of compromise. And so I kind of separated them and kind of grouped them by conditions in that case. So I can group with the condition and it makes it easier to promote maintenance on your rules. Uh, in these uh, three examples I have, uh, I just had three actually, but I had like up to 10. I had up to 10 for all 100 uh, different indicators. So I had 10 different rules I was, I was in managing uh, but it was a lot easier because if one was false positing, um, I had a different confidence value when I need to make a change and whatnot about it. And so rather than I can then just focus on this one rule and all the other nine rules, I didn't even have to worry about. So the ghost beacons, I split them up length four, just got like one little indicator. Uh, length five had 85 different hey, indicators in it, indicators so that's seven, and then length six seven had, gigabyte uh, RAM ausgelastet me, had three of them. And, gigabyte swap. and so how would you, how would you kind of separate, just for, because not everybody knows Yara, so an example, how would you kind of separate that in regular expressions? I'll let you chew on this regular expression for a second while I take a step, why not? So this guy's kind of looking for like landing pages to do like man in the middle attacks for PayPal, uh, you know, Yahoo, Hotmail, uh, <laughs> they got PowerPoint online, Word online, so like Office 365 and whatnot. Um, these are all these kind of landing pages that they're trying to man in the middle and get your credentials. And with the regular expressions, you're just grouping the IOCs uh, with the OR clause pretty much. And so uh, that's that's how you would do the equivalent of this rule from Yara, similar in a regular expression. Uh, it's a totally different detection, but it's the same idea, same concept, and whatnot. So another thing is uh, that you can separate your indicators by, so I talked about the, the condition statement uh, in Yara, but you can also separate them uh, towards the indicators of compromise as well, grouping the indicators of compromise. So what I like to do, so these are four different rules for strings out of an APT3 binary. Notice the hash is all the same for all four rules. Um, and, uh, but I have four different rules for strings. 
What's the, the, the thing that I said earlier, the one rule to rule them all? That's what most analysts do. They all want to just jumble them up into one YAR rule and say, hey, give me this and do, you know, get, gives you some kind of complex exp uh, expression at the end of the condition and say, hey, this grouping or this grouping or this other grouping or this other grouping. Well, you can, you, if you break them out into different rules and then you be very selective with your rule names, excuse me, you can bring a lot of value to your analysis. When you start separating your detections like this, you start augmenting your analysis. And you can say, hey, this, uh, I got this one binary here. It hit on one of these four string, string rules for APT3. Maybe that's not an APT3 binary, but I got this other binary that hit on three of the four. And so when it hits on three of the four, you're like, okay, it's, pro it's more than likely APT, and then, oh wait, so we didn't have the fifth, the fourth rule? So maybe there's a shift in your detections. Maybe you're detecting, you're, you're detecting the shift in, um, Do you see in targeting that? and whatnot. And so their binaries are kind of changing. You know, they may have a different campaign going on. And so a different person on the team is compiling these or something. Or, and, or they fix their incorrect spellings and whatnot. And so... Leute, braucht man die Schiene jetzt mit drin oder nicht? Uh, ich probier mal. Du brauchst wahrscheinlich schon die Schiene mit drin, ne? Klar brauchst du die Schiene mit drin. Okay. Schwachsinn. Alter. Okay, wenn man den berührt, dann fährt der gleich. Wir wollen den unverschoben lassen. Dann wollen wir den da reinschieben. I don't know, Leute. Also das kann hier nur nicht klappen, oder? Aber ich würde sagen, let's go. Vielleicht sollte ich mal... mein TNT sichern. Aber die Wahrscheinlichkeit, dass ich jetzt wieder sterbe, ist natürlich erstaunlich hoch. Eigentlich könnte ich mir ja auch mal ein Bett bauen und dann die ganze Zeit wieder respawnen. <lacht> das ist ja lächerlich, was hier abgeht. Uh, like if you look at some of these groupings, uh, just I have some regular strings, just unique, very unique strings. Um, then I have network GUID strings, um, and so uh, and then notice that with the um, with the first rule there of strings that uh, I, I say any of them, right? So that's basically the OR clause with any of them, and any one of those strings would are unique enough that they could stand on their own. You don't need any other supporting strings to kind of make your detection. And whatnot. Now there's a couple. There's two rules. There's two rules with any of them, and there's two rules with all of them. And so the rules with all of them, where it says all of them in the condition, those are your lesser quality indicators. You can still group them. It's kind of any club, The strength of all four What's indicators to compromise to say to give you that confidence layer layer on your hit and whatnot. And so if you look, and then there's uh there's output strings, bad grammar. So I'm even calling out Die bad grammar. So if I, Wieso klappt es nicht? <lacht> ah. Ich es ich nicht. Hat's nicht irgendwann mal schon mal geklappt? Ich baue doch irgendwas falsch hier. Oh. You know, when people make mistakes in spellings, now granted there's a lot of code reuse and, and whatnot. So when you have all these mistakes like this, especially grammar mistakes, you can 
generally kind of attributed to one one person or but if you start seeing more and more then and there's a lot of different compilations floating around then there's probably some code reuse going on as well and that's how you would detect that stuff uh, and then you have uh, more output strings. So the output of the, this tool was their apt remote command tool. Um, I can't remember if I wrote these rules. I probably did. I don't know. I didn't put my name. I, I guess I should have put my name on it, whether I was the author or not, though. But uh, I, it's a good grouping. It's a good representation of what I'm trying to convey to you guys on splitting up your detections uh, to make them more manageable and whatnot. So uh, let's see. One more. Uh, yeah, one more wall of text, and then we'll get back to some other stuff. Um, so we talked about groupings by conditions. We talked about groupings by indicators of compromise or string sections, um, or in right in Drop with uh, plus uh, regex, you know, you're using your or, your or statement. Um, the next one, you 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 still want to try and create multiple detections, but you want to use multiple detection methods. So I have three rules up here that are all looking for the same technique. They're looking for a very simple embedded executable. That's it. Nothing fancy, well, maybe the detections are a little fancy, but nothing fancy about the, what the technique that I'm trying to detect, right? And like I said, this is what I said earlier about how when you build enough of these rules, the more rules you have, the more you can augment your analysis. And so you can save this time up front on, uh, by just by running Yara or your regular expressions and let those automated scans do your triage for you. And, um, and so when you, when you can have your, a, a large enough rule set to scanning and do triage, and then you can have, without even throwing the binary in a hex editor or Ida Pro or uh, even a text editor or something like that, you can run it against your rule set and you can get somewhat of a disposition, whether it be benign, um, you still may need to verify it if it's benign, you can get some sort of suspect disposition, it's doing all these techniques, but then there's nothing attributable that's going on, or you can get a malicious disposition right off the bat if you have an attributable signature. And so you can say, hey, this is definitely malicious, I can attribute it to this group, how much more do I need to spend on this so I can move on to the next binary? Uh, so, like I said, these are three three different rules targeting uh, embedded executables. One of them looks for more than one DOS stub. So the DOS, uh, the 16-bit DOS stub that's in pre present in the 32-bit Windows V header, or just before it, I'm sorry, the MZ header, the 16-bit. Um, so it looks for multiple DOS stubs. The other one, it looks for a possible PD structure in which the, the DOS stub may have been stripped. And then there's another one that looks for a DOS stub. Um, it just sort of looks for an additional DOS stub past the, the initial DOS header. And so, well, what happens if the, the outer binary has a do, doesn't have a DOS stub and then the embedded binary does? And so these are three different techniques to kind of catch embedded executables uh, using these rules. So next I want to talk to you about some uh, detection targeting approaches and whatnot. But first, let me take a step. So, what is the plan so we're all yet? on the hunt, right? We're all on the hunt. Um, what is what the, the plan? The Black Hat Talk uh, 2015 big game hunting. We're all on the hunt for big game, big game hour and whatnot. Um, the original big game was, was Jaws, right? Um, so, uh, as, you know, as I go through all my data, I realize some things, uh, and, uh, that I'm, I'm, I'm hunting, but as a malware analyst, right, right? So I'm always on the hunt for that big game. So I can make an argument of, this is bad, you know, and, and it could be just some random file, this is bad any day of the week, blah, 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 because of the context you give it to me in. And um, I can do that a couple different ways. I can do that with um, kind of unique code DNA. Uh, you could either do it with the strings, with the, the very unique strings, or you can do it with unique byte sequences, right? So that unique DNA allows you to track the families and go hunt. 
But I noticed when hunting that the data that I was looking, or the rules that I was producing, based on the data that I was looking at, I had a bias. Like I said, I can make an argument for anything to be malicious, right? And uh, given a limited scope of the of the view. And so my, yeah. I didn't realize, but my detections also were becoming biased. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're hunting for that shark. We're hunting for jaws, right? And we see the fin come out the water. But then we look under the water. We look and we see the whole scope. And it's just some guy wearing a shark fin, right? It's, it's like hmm. you're, and you're confused. You're like, wait, I thought this guy was bad. What, you know, what, why is he not bad? But it's just some guy with a shark fin strapped to the back, to his back, right? Now, once you've seen the whole picture, and uh, I got that way actually, uh, or at least I, I noticed that because just enough customers are like, no, this is this is good. I'm like, no, this is bad, and they're like, no, this is good. And so <laughs> I would argue with people and and whatnot. And so I, I noticed the the bias in the detections. And so I noticed that a lot of my detections were as a malware analyst. And so I got to thinking, well, what would a network admin's detection be like? You know, how would you, how would they write a detection um, and whatnot? With, with malware authors, we're looking in a sea of bad, or a sea, a sea of, let's see, what's, uh, yeah, we're looking from a sea of bad that ignore the good and then the network admins are writing their detections. They're writing detections from a sea of good to detect or highlight the anomalous bad, right? So they're almost seeing this, this kind of inverse view of what we're looking at as a malware author. So how do you write a malware analyst detection in regex, right? I showed you the one uh, prior, you know, with the, the the kind of the DNA, right, the unique sequences. But how do you write that in regex? Um, so I had a customer that was like, hey, I want to see these. They had these custom mail headers, and they were getting uh, mail from all over the world, and they were like, look, I know, I know this is bad. It's coming from this country, or it's coming from that country, and how do I detect this stuff? So I, I started writing these regular expressions, and then it quickly got out of hand for him. He's like, look, now, you know, he's like, you showed me how to do this, but now look, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different countries, and I'm getting new ones popping up every other day or so. And so um, we can't really take that approach in our detections, right? Or at least the network admins can't take that approach in our detections. So I had to kind of think of it, and I had to flip, and I had to go inverse. How would I do this? And he's like, you know, really, we only do business with these three companies, I mean, three countries. And he's like, if you can get, write me a signature that, you know, if it's not these three countries, and I know, like, the DOD, you got five eyes and stuff like that, like, people, there's, and then there are smaller companies that, you know, they're only doing, they, they know they don't have a, 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 an office in Madagascar or something like that, or, or Nigeria, and, uh, I mean, they may have a Nigerian, maybe related to a Nigerian prince, but they don't have an office, an office in Nigeria, right? Um, and so, and then they had these other kind of headers that were coming in through, uh, through one of their, their things upstream, and they were marking all this mail stuff for us. I'm like, man, this is a gold mine here, right? And he's like, look, I want to find all these different, uh, these different detections based on these, or the, the non-presence of these strings and whatnot. So I, I kind of took the, I went the, the, red, the regular expression route, and, um, and when I inversed it, I, I, uh, I came up with negative look-aheads, right? And so uh, they're a little complex. Like I said, if you want to read into them, go back to the talk afterwards and kind of see it. It's all about creating a set, and then you have to a match to non-match on, and then another matching set. It gets a little hairy, 
Um, but I definitely suggest going on like Regex 101 to help you build your, your regular expressions and whatnot. So. Uh, and I came up with three these three detections for these three different X headers for the situations that he wanted me to do. And it worked out great. He's like, man, this, this is awesome. I, I don't have to do I don't have to do any maintenance anymore for these this, these detections. And um, and it did everything that he wanted to accomplish. So, you know. And that was kind of looking at that, that inverse view, right? So we, we talked about kind of the malware analyst detections. We talked about the bias that it kind of creates and um, how a network admin uh, Wie hoch ist die Wahrscheinlichkeit, dass ich, wenn ich das jetzt zum vierten Mal probiere, dass es klappt? Um, mm. But how do you get longevity out of your stuff? Um, Nicht so hoch. And I have a, a technique Kann es sein, dass das that, Teil uh, eigentlich call, hier hin muss? Uh, I'll also describe them. Uh, just circular detections. I'll write a couple rules based on a Kann few things. Kann das sein? And, um, and those two, those two target rule sets are mutually exclusive, right? They have Eventuell. nothing. They, they share the sample, but they don't share any same indicators of compromise, right? And so, um, so I'll create these these circular detections. I'll have rule one. Uh, and it's and it detects a piece of malware, um, but then I have another rule that I built off of my original source. Um, but rule one detected this malware, but rule two didn't trigger. Analyze it. We know it's malware, but when I analyze it, I get an update to rule two. Um, so I got that rule. I got a new indicator of compromise for rule two that I didn't already have from my first original sample, right? And most people who do a lot of uh, virus total or reversing labs hunting, do a lot of retro hunts, uh, you guys are used to this stuff, um, kind of panning out and finding the broader campaign. Uh, this is a kind of common thing. But I want everybody else so who's not you. a malware analyst uh, or this. not a malware hunter to kind of you know, learn this stuff, so that's why I'm telling you about it. Aha! So, uh, how do you do these circular detections, right? Aha! So, uh... It's fun in the front in the box and stuff, uh, line, and then... It's actually a throwback to my old talk. Uh, the, the payload how names, I've got these weird little payload names and these small DLLs. Uh, but we can run the test right now, this is stuff from other stuff. And they kind of had some of these unique names. Now, it's set up that MSI may not be unique, but it's kind of unique in the context of it's a DLL on 2011K, right? Um, and then I came up with a, a string deobfuscation routine. Um, and that routine, so I had the payload name that was embedded into the, the loader, and I had a string deobfuscation routine uh, that was also embedded in the loader, but it deobfuscated um, it, the, the payload, not the, the strings for the file. And so, uh, so I, I run it, I do a retro hunt, find, find a bunch of other files, uh, and then I go on to round two. And I found some new payload names. So my set of uh, indicators of compromise just got larger, right? And they all stand apart from each other, so they can all be a, a detection on their own. Um, but I went from having two payload names to I now have eight payload names. And then, instead of having just one byte sequence for the, the string deobfuscation, I thought for the payload deobfuscation, I now have three. I only got two rules up okay. there. But the plus so the Frage is, and so I ended up getting three. And um, come I keep doing these iterations, and I keep finding more rules, and this more, more, more intel, and I keep finding more malware. And in the end, I end up with like 27 payload names. Some of which um, may not have even yeah. been plug X. Tatsächlich, the okay, man can so They were using a similar delivery method, or at least I suspect Geil. they were using a similar delivery method for a couple different pieces of malware. And then the, uh, for as far as the strings, and then the, the byte sequences. So, then can we da vorne den, um, den Bahnhof so, abbauen und da uh, durchfahren? Und hoffentlich wieder einsteigen, das wäre krass. Wenn ich eine Zeit hätte, wenn ein Fall scannt wurde, dann hätte ich ein Subset von vielleicht 5 von 10 
Die Frage ist, was ist, wenn diese Ficker kommen, diese Phantoms, und mich angreifen? Fliege ich dann runter? Wie ist das so lustig? Oh, ich fahre gerade in die falsche Richtung, fällt mir auf. Ich wollte eigentlich zum Spawn fahren. Ja, ich war mir so sicher, dass es da Richtung Spawn geht. Ja, dann sollte es mal lieber rausgehen, oder? Computer Trace Agent 
and they were patching the, the beacon, the uh, domain beacon. That's all they were doing. It was a normal CompuTrace agent, uh, DLL, uh, different from a fancy bear, was only 28 bytes. And then it was XOR, so it was obfuscated. And so since it was obfuscated, you can't pre-predict what those domains are going to be. So how do you signature the unsignaturable, right? There is no real code in there that's attributable to Fancy Bear. So it, this was a CompuTrace binary. And, um, and so I, it took me a while to kind of tear it down and to kind of come to this discovery, did a byte by byte comparison, and finally I was like, no, we didn't get hacked by the Russians. It's just whoever, we have like one box in the network that's, that has this CompuTrace software running. Let's go get the IT department, let's clean it up and whatnot. And so, um, and to, to, the, to Thor APT scanners kind of credit, he, so this was day before Thanksgiving, so it's November 2018. And then in March Ooh, 2019, he, uh, he actually Fuck. renamed the rule. Uh, he changed it instead of mal for the first three. He changed it to PUP, uh, which is a potentially unwanted program. Uh, thanks to a colleague of mine, I was like, what is PUP, right? right? And um, even I was, like, I'm a seasoned guy, and I was like, what is PUP? And um, I was like, what does that make any difference? Well, it, but he still got the fancy bear attribution in there. And that rule, once you look at it, it's hitting on all these comp, uh, CompuTrace binaries in virus total, maybe it's running in reversing labs as well. So anybody who goes and looks up a CompuTrace binary in virus total, they're going to get false attribution of uh, fancy bear for Stop. this binary. And they, they themselves will be think they got hacked by uh, fancy bear. And so you see that domino effect of um, you know the just prop doing things kind of proper, taking your time, you know, making multiple detections, and uh, you know. Doing, doing proper naming conventions and whatnot, and just kind of slowing it up a bit, and not having that that one rule to kind of rule them all mentality. And so that's kind of my story. Uh, does anybody kind of have any questions or anything, or or what? Mm -hmm. Okay. Whoa. Mm -hmm. 5000 Blöcke sind wir vom Spawn weg. Also, das ist halt die Frage, wie lange es braucht, bis wir da hingefahren kommen. Ne? I would say, yeah, it's a, it's maybe you can do some automation into it and look at ratios and whatnot. Um, I kind of, when I do my circular detections, I, I do a lot of bytecode optimizations and um, I'll look back at the, the assembly table. Uh, take a look back at, at my previous talk and I, I talk a little bit about it, but where do you stop? Yeah, it's, it's most of the time it's kind of by the analyst because most of us, I mean, we're all pretty bad. We're, we're doing things, we're hand jamming things. Uh, most of us probably should be, you know, because we all, a lot of the, the SOC people, they're just getting things on a whim. And, you know, if they write a script, they can take an hour out of their time to write a script, they may never use that script again and do any kind of automation with it. But with the, the rules that you're doing, you can do some triage up front. But yeah, where do you kind of stop okay, it? It is kind of up to the phone. analyst. You just got to find that line within your workflow, I'd say. Uh, if you do have it in, in, a, in a malware shop and you got a, big, a much bigger automated workflow, then I'd say then you got to need to see, you know, give it some thresholds or something like that and say, hey, you know, I got some malware that in my eyes is pretty rare and whatever the source that may came from, and let's say if I get a hundred hits on it, I'll I'll just stop right there, right? If I get a hundred hits, because probably more than it, 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 it's a high confidence, very targeted What's sample. My, uh, my why are there going to be a hundred hits out there? You know, or you get a thousand, you can bump that up to a thousand maybe. And so once you kind of get to that that level, you can kind of see, okay, yeah, this is a lot of noise. But then once your rule set gets more mature, you can leverage more of your rule set to kind of give you Der war schon that so other feeling. Oder? So you don't, you're not really always relying on the numbers. Does that kind of make sense? So, at least in my, that's my point of view. So, yeah. 
Any other questions? Nein, der kommt nicht hier hin. Alter. I know it was a lot, guys, and I thank you, and thank you for, for all the people that have stayed. Uh, a lot of technical stuff. Go back and watch it. Uh, a lot of text on there. Chew on some of those YAR rules and whatnot. If you haven't played with it, play with it. It's a great thing. Regular expressions, too, and, and whatnot. So, so, yeah. Thank you, guys. Okay, das war wieder einer dieser Talks, wo ich so gar nichts mitbekommen habe. Aber wobei man jetzt wahrscheinlich ihn nicht dafür verantwortlich machen kann, sondern meine Fähigkeit, mich zu konzentrieren eher. Ich würde dann doch gern noch ein kleines Speedbild in der Folge machen und das Teil in dieser Folge hier noch fertig bauen. Kann ja nur schief gehen, wenn man sich dabei beeilt. Aber nach dem Erfolg gerade muss ich hier weiter reiten. Okay. Ba, 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 ba. Blub, blub. Okay. Das ist ein bisschen nah vielleicht. Dann machen wir den hier hin. Papp, 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 papp. Hoffen wir, das Teil fährt doch in die richtige Richtung los. Yikes. Wo sind denn die ganzen Phantoms? Haben die Leute wieder viel geschlafen hier oder was ist da los? Hm. Ich warte eigentlich nur drauf, dass die mich hier runter snacken. Okay, wir brauchen ein bisschen TNT. Nehmen wir mal zwei Stück, bevor wir wieder in die Luft fliegen. Super. <lacht> Seid ihr gespannt? Ich meine, diesmal könnte es ja echt klappen. Ähm, aber so, so real reels echt. Haha, <lacht> kein Eisen. Äh, mein Gott. Äh, <lacht> ja. Okay. Oh, wir sollten das hier vielleicht unterbrechen. Mögliche Komplikationen zu verhindern. So, das könnte jetzt tatsächlich funktionieren. aufgeregt. <lacht> Leute, ich bin so aufgeregt. <lacht> Grip Schuhe. Let's go! Okay, wir sind schon mal nicht abgestürzt. Das ist gut. Feuern wir auch? Wir feuern auch. So, jetzt natürlich der nächste Check. Fahren wir in die richtige Richtung? Ja. Wir sind so ziemlich auf ähm, auf Null. Oder das XY. 
sind wir Set. Wir sind 100 hoch, oder? Und bei minus 30. Ja, minus 30, perfekt. Das ist direkt der Spawn eigentlich, ne? Und dann, ähm, bei minus 5000. Oh mein Gott. Okay, super. Wir sind so circa ein Block pro Sekunde. Vielleicht. Dauert das Ganze 5000 Sekunden. Oh mein Quick Maths hier. Äh, 5000. Haben wir 80 Minuten, kann das sein? Dann sind wir fast in zwei Stunden oder so. Also in zwei Stunden spätestens sind wir schon über den Spawn drüber gefahren. Habe ich das richtig gerechnet hier? Das geht ja super schnell. Ja, wir sind halt auch nicht so weit weg vom Spawn. Das ist halt die Sache. Es ist nur die Frage, ob man hier AFK gehen kann oder ob die Phantoms dann kommen und kurz einen Prozess machen. Ähm ja, ich denke, das und vieles mehr erfahren Sie in der nächsten Episode dieser Dauerwerbesendung. Und ähm, der Titel zum Video von äh, Jay äh, von der DEFCON ist natürlich wie immer in der Beschreibung, genauso wie ähm, die IP-Adresse von diesem Anarchie-Server, ähm, den ich euch hier in der Vanilla-Version bereitstelle. Ähm, ja, ich bin ziemlich glücklich, dass es das jetzt endlich funktioniert hat. Und ähm, dann würde ich sagen, sehen wir uns in der nächsten Episode. Oh mein Gott, wie das alles packt, ey. Minecraft ist so lost, dieses Spiel. Aber es funktioniert. Es funktioniert. Das ist doch wunderbar. Okay, dann haut rein.